Radhika Kali said that you cannot know what it's like to be a mother unless you are one. And that's problematic for me because I really want to know. I really do want to know. <laughs> and I have the misfortune of being a man. And apparently I'm not alone. There's this field of really enthusiastic researchers in China, male uh, researchers, who found a way to stimulate the lower abdomen of men, you know, putting electrodes over there, and simulate the experience of, of, of going through labor pains. And it was control tested with women who had had that experience, and it was quite accurate. So the test had a good start. Would you like to know how long the toughest guy managed? Yeah. Oh, you guys know the ad? Oh, okay, okay. One and a half minutes. <laughs> One and a half minutes. So using this, I think I can at least attempt to take that journey. The reason why this matters to me and why an experience such as that would matter to me, because it seems that to endure such a huge amount of pain for hours, which we can only manage an hour and a half, means that... Oh, a minute and a half, sorry, who was counting? It really challenges my definition of what it is to be brave, and I would like to be brave. For a long time in my life as a young man, I defined myself as brave. I defined myself as being willing to do the things that um, what I had defined by maybe no fault of my own, maybe societal pressures, as being brave. And that certainly didn't mean um, you know, the sort of sacrifices that I saw my mother making, because I would much rather have preferred she not make those sacrifices. <laughs> to, to every, every time I saw my mother struggle on my behalf, you know, um, paying school fees, not just for myself, but for five kids, all I could think about was that I wish I didn't have to be this burden. I wish I could be independent, making my own money, going out there, fighting with a big bad world. You know, that was my definition of, of being brave. But the older I, I became, I realized that there's something very problematic with that impulse. And that impulse, I'll tell you where it has taken me. It has taken me into entrepreneurship. It's taken me into relationship adventures. It's taken me into <laughs> many things. And one thing that was a guiding principle of, of all these things I was trying to understand, to define, to reduce the world into small little chunks that I could consume and say that I am knowledgeable. I have now gotten to the place where I've abandoned that mission. I have completely abandoned. All that we can do is just scratch at the surface of our ignorance and hope that our kids won't suffer as much as we, we have. <laughs> And so I'll take it in sequence so I don't drone on, because people who know me know I have that weakness. I don't write speeches. Life, love, mothers. Life. There's a scientist who I'm a very big fan of called Alan Turing. He came up with something called the Turing test. The Turing test was a way of judging whether or not a machine, you are communicating with a machine or a human being. At the time, he, this was the father of computing, modern computing. At the time he did it, obviously it was ridiculous. Fast forward to today, you all have to go through verification checks to make sure that you're human beings. And we've gotten to a place where it's absolutely impossible to define somebody as being living as based on our perception of, 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 of them being alive. And, and, and this might not be very important to you in your day-to-day -day life, being a, a banker or whatever, but these questions really matter to doctors who have to do, uh, decide whether or not to pull the plug on somebody, are they alive? It matters to lawyers who have to legislate to give the doctor the right to be able to do that. It, uh, so those tight definitions matter. And we're getting into very problematic territory. On the question of love, I approached love with the same very defined wanting to reduce it into something I could understand. And it was very important to hear words such as, I love you, to have a definition of what, okay, if it checks this list, this is what love looks like. But then, that is also problematic because I myself, and I'm sure Don did, we come from the same ancestral land, Uche, I've never heard my parents say, I love you, not once. <laughs> never. Never. Not on Valentine's Day, not on Christmas. <laughs> never. Just didn't happen. And so I have, I have accepted that there is something so vast and so complex about this experience of, of, of being in love 
that they don't feel the need to say it. Because if you, <laughs> if you, if you, feel, if you feel the need to reassure somebody, then they are probably already inclined to doubt it. I'll tell you why. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and because the very same way, I'll tell you something that the Turing test teaches us, the, the, the test of deciding. There's a reason why I mentioned it. I remember there was a reason. The reason why it's impossible for us to always be sure whether we're communicating with a machine or not, if it's just a question of intelligence, I'm sure when you watch the evening news, half of the people you see on the screen are not half as intelligent as, you know, uh, your smartphones and the rest of this. Uh, so it cannot be intelligence. There is something to being human that is beyond mere intelligence. There is something about love that cannot be reduced into a dictionary. And, we, and this question matters because we are confronted by a culture which is exposing us to images where we need to give demonstrations. You need to buy a diamond and make that as a, you need to, you need to do, you need to do those, those things, and those things are not necessarily bad, but we need to remember that it's about the demonstration, and that is the only true compass you have for knowing whether or not you're talking about the same thing, because the, the person who merely mouths the words, I love you, could mean that I'm going to punch you, or they could mean that I'm going to give you chocolates, I'm going to make your life nice. I mean, it's so we have to look beneath the meaning of the words. And this is important to me because I used to think that um, grasping language meant that you were grasping truth. And that's not the same thing. And all the language in the world has not helped me define any of these things. So be reassured that your mother tongues don't have the word love in them. What's the last thing? <laughs> we'll, come, we'll, come, we'll come back to, to, to mothers. I hope you hear everything that everybody said resonating. These questions matter not just to me and my own journey toward bravery, toward enterprise, toward empathy. They matter to the whole world. The world which we live in, the world with the lattes and the banks and all these things was constructed by the Industrial Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution was constructed by men. And it was constructed at a time that there was always somewhere else to conquer. There was always somewhere else to go. You could always be brave at someone else's expense. You could become rich at someone else's suffering. We have very quickly come to a place in our world right now where there are no more new territories to conquer. When we have nuclear weapons, so that makes it very interesting. Any confrontation that goes over the edge, we could end up in problems. I've been lucky enough to be involved with, uh, with elephants for the last, I'd say, two and a half years. And one thing that it has shown me was that my path to humanity was through animals. Because when I saw the people who are at the knife's edge of the culture that we created of growing at the expense of other people, are the animals, because they don't have a voice. But what happens when we run out of these things? We run out of bees, we run out of tea, we run out of lattes. Uh, we have to rethink our model. And the only model which I can think of that works is the mother's model. So I've gone full circle. I realize that the only way to live sustainably and make money sustainably is if I embrace a spirit of self-sacrifice and see that there is nobility in in sacrifice and caring on behalf of others, as opposed to si simply thinking about myself and my latte and my, and my car and all these other things. <laughs> so what I'd urge all of you to do, what I'd urge all of you to do is escape the capsules, become claustrophobic. I wish claustrophobia on all of you. We live in a life, <laughs> we live in a life which keeps us inside capsules, whether it's intellectual capsules, whether it's in terms of how we live. We live in small apartments. You climb into a stairwell. You go down the stairwell. You enter another capsule, which is your car. You go to your office, <laughs> enough, another capsule. So we need to escape these capsules which are separating us from each other. There are no real definitions. Everything that we look at to, to define our world are simply tools. They are not meant to be the thing itself. Throw away your dictionary. Stop needing to understand everything. Just be taken by the carelessness of nature because it's wise and it knows more than you.
It completely knows more than you. If you, if you trust yourself to know everything, you will run yourself into trouble, and I, will, I, I can tell you, first, you know, I have the best experience in getting into every manner of trouble from trying to understand things. So, ignorance is bliss. I wish you all a happy Mother's Day. <laughs>